before quantum mechanics, the, uh, the German philosopher Husserl said that all perception is gamble. Every type of bigotry, every type of racism, sexism, prejudice, every dogmatic ideology that, that allows people to kill other people with a clear conscience, every stupid cult, every superstition-ridden religion, every kind of ignorance in the world, all results from not realizing that our perceptions are gambles. We believe what we see and then we believe our interpretation of it. We don't even know we're making an interpretation most of the time. We think this is reality. In philosophy, that's called naive realism. What I perceive is reality. And philosophers have refuted naive realism every century for the last 2,500 years, starting with Buddha and Plato. And yet most people still act on the basis of naive realism. Now the argument is, well, maybe my perceptions are inaccurate, but somewhere there is accuracy. The scientists have it with their instruments. That's how we can find out what's really real. But relativity and quantum mechanics have demonstrated clearly that what you find out with instruments is true relative only to the instrument you're using and where that instrument is located in space-time. So there is no vantage point from which real reality can be seen. We're all looking from the point of view of our own reality tunnels. And uh, when we begin to realize that we're all looking from the point of view of our own reality tunnels, we find it is much easier to understand where other people are coming from, or the ones who don't have the same reality tunnel as us do not seem ignorant or deliberately perverse or lying or hypnotized by some mad ideology they just have a different reality tunnel and every reality tunnel might tell us something interesting about our world if we're willing to listen the idea every perception is a gamble it seems to be so obviously true that i continually am astonished that i i can forget it so many times in the course of 24 hours but to the extent that I remember it, I can't stay, I can't stay angry at anybody, so it's a thing worth be, keeping in mind. <laughs> They seems like a dinosaur. I seem more like a dinosaur myself. Well, you know, we're all rapidly turning into dinosaurs. <laughs> Sometimes I feel as old as the Mojave Desert. <laughs> Sometimes I look in the mirror and I think I look like a dead mule. <laughs> That's, only... <laughs> That's only when I first get up in the morning. <laughs> it hurt this morning for about an hour after I got up. That's about all. You just took a little bit of muffin in the morning? And... I took a little bit of muffin. It hasn't bothered me since. I haven't taken any more muffin. Mm -hmm. As you may have guessed, I have post-polio sequelae, which is the symptoms that follow polio, sometimes 20 years later, sometimes 40 years later. In my case, it took 60 years before they caught up with me. One of them is a lot of leg problems, which is why I'm in a wheelchair. Another one is that I feel 20 degrees colder than the average person, whatever the temperature is. I had polio at the age of four. I was cured by the Sister Kenny method at a time when the American Medical Association was announcing her as a quack and a charlatan and a witch doctor. <laughs> It was about, no, oh, about six years after I was cured by the Sister Kenny method that the AMA finally admitted the method worked. Now nobody needs it anymore because nobody gets polio anymore. They, they got the vaccine for it. But uh, I, I knew all my life I had post-polio syndrome, but, but it was always mild. I had uh, what they call myoclonism, which is spasms in the feet which can be a damn nuisance when you're trying to sleep at night and the feet start jerking and waking you up. And then I had pains in the legs when I had to stand on long lines. I got to hate airports. I can walk a few steps. As a matter of fact, I can walk more than a few steps, but I'm not going to try it because 
If I fall down, everybody will be embarrassed and feel sorry for me. But you see, I can walk a few steps, which I couldn't do two years ago when the thing was at its worst. Post-polio syndrome turned really cleared up. That was, that will be two years ago next month. And boy, there was a week there when I could hardly move. Everything hurt. Going to the bathroom was like going to the South Pole with Admiral Byrd. I mean, getting come, oh God. <laughs> I couldn't move anything without terrible pains. Maybe some of the dead muscles are coming back to life and the, the cell bodies are putting forth axons and then drown. That's, that's what's supposed to be happening anyway. Somehow dealing with the post-polio has given me a greater self-esteem, as they say nowadays. I feel, hell, I'm dealing with this very well. I, I feel pretty good for myself. And I still have time to think about other people, which is very important. The worst thing about it, you know, is it makes you self-centered. I don't think that's happened, really. So, I, I think you can get a lot out of an illness. Processing interactions, tuning in interactive processes. Processing interacting is all I ever tune in. I cannot tune in anything but interacting processing. The, the biggest thing I got from Bob is that uh, all of our reality constructs are models. You know, all of them are approximations, are metaphors, are allegories for what's going on. And that we live in a world where we are all negotiating. Um, our, we're negotiating um, for on behalf of our stories. All thought is metaphor. Uh, the map is not the territory. Every verbal map we make is a metaphor, but existence is not words, it's not a mathematical equations. The universe is much bigger and more complicated than any little map we can make of it. The map is not the territory. The words that describe the map are not the territory. They're even further from the territory. So none of it is the map not show all the territory, but the map is a generalization which doesn't fit any particular territory. What I perceive is not what's out there, it's just what I perceive. Blinks and uh, his attack on the moon. The scientist says uh, the sun is a molten rock in the sky. Can you not see that? Blake says, I cannot see that. I see a choir of angels singing glory, glory, glory to the Lord God omnipotent. And that's Blake's reality. Uh, both realities are equally right, depending on where, where you're at. If you want to do a chemical analysis of the sun, you use the scientific reality. It's not a rock anymore, it's a nuclear furnace. But you use the latest scientific reality. But subjectively, I understand how Blake felt when he saw the sun as a bunch of angels singing glory, glory, glory to the Lord God. I, I've seen trees doing that. Uh, that's a very valuable reality tunnel to be in. One doesn't contradict the other. You know, we each create a story, a narrative, a picture, an allegory, a model for what's going on here, and then we fight, sometimes to the death, to make others, if not believe in that model, we fight to, to be able to keep believing it in ourselves. So we, we try to erase con contradictory evidence to that model. I agree with the Buddha, there is no meaning in life. The meaning is in sentences. Meaning is in symbols that symbolize life. Life itself does not have a meaning because that's what meaning refers to. Meaning refers to life. To look for meaning in life is like looking for trees on a map. You can find squiggles that represent trees. When you find the trees there, the squiggles only really represent the trees. Or the rivers. You can't wash in a river on a map. You gotta find a real river in the non-map world. Is that clear? I'm trying to make a difference between the words and the metaphors and the existential experiences. But it, it also becomes where I, uh, 
I end up kind of parting ways philosophically with him too. You know, I get the feeling that that Bob is not just a spiritual but anti-spiritual. You know, he 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 doesn't believe in God or spirit or a, a special super reality connecting us all because it's not there, because it's not evident, because it's not apparent. And I feel in a way like Bob's worldview, having having passed through the, the chapel perilous uh, of, of, of wonder, uh, that his view now is that, well, there's nothing. You know, this is it, period. As far as I'm concerned, the idea that there's nothing is just another what if. You know, it's, it's the skeptic in, in Cosmic Trigger. It's the skeptic's worldview but it's just a worldview, and I don't think it's any intrinsically safer. I have heard it said in a critical way that Robert Anton Wilson doesn't believe in anything, and if that is true, then I applaud him for that, because that is the hallmark of a truly free man. As long as you subscribe to a dogma, any dogma, no matter how benign, you will never be free. And if Bob doesn't believe in anything, that is not to say that he doesn't care about things. I think he cares about things passionately. It's just that he hasn't allowed the central focus of his intellect and his emotions to be usurped by some ideology. But maybe, maybe refusing to believe in belief is an ideology, but if, if so, it's a very flexible one. Non-simultaneously apprehended interacting processing. I see no nouns, I only see verbs. Not only do I seem to be a verb like Bucky Fuller with the whole universe, scenario universe seems to be a verb. Interacting processing. He does not seem to be stricken by polio. You know, it seems to be that that's a happenstance, something that's occurring with the body. But it, it hasn't dampened his, his really remarkable spirit. Mm -hmm. um, his body, you know, his body's failing. Post-polio is a dramatic and, um, and, you know, brutal opponent at times. But I... I believe that he is always looking for a new discovery and in that, whether it's trying to take fewer steps um, because his, his polio won't allow him to walk and yet, you know, how he greets that is still with that same wonder. It's, it's an experiment. One of the greatest relief I get from pain is from marijuana brownies made by uh, women's collective, uh, people with muscular dystrophy, post-polio syndrome, AIDS, can cancer, and a few other problems that are <laughs> very clearly and obviously helped by marijuana brownies. And when this federal government announces that they've canceled the Tenth Amendment and the states have no right to legalize anything that the federal government is against, I am naturally furious. They're threatening me with a life of steady pain until I die. That's what they're threatening me with. Of course I'm pissed off at them. And it's not just for my own sake, but it's for the sake of all the AIDS patients, all the cancer patients, all the other people who are, who, for whom life is bearable because they can get uh, some marijuana in one form or another. It is, it is one of the best painkillers known, and it's not addictive, and it, and it has an extra added benefit, the high, which is what everybody, which is what the, the SOG is afraid of. They don't want anybody to get high because people who are high get happy and people who get happy get ambitious and uppity and rambunctious. They want everybody to be depressed. 